Hello everybody, welcome back to Photorec.tv. I'm Toby and I have a sweet spot for this camera. You see, it was almost 20 years ago that I wanted to get a little more serious about photography and the best camera that I could afford on my teacher's budget was the Canon Rebel XT. And in many ways, this entry level mirrorless, the Canon R10, is very similar to that early DSLR. This is a small and lightweight camera offering a good value and provides beginner photographers plenty of room to grow. That Canon Rebel XT served me really well. It wasn't actually until I started shooting professionally that I remember feeling some of its limitations. I don't really feel like this camera has any limitations that are gonna hold you back anytime soon. That's really not the main issue I have with this Canon. It is in fact, the ecosystem of lenses or lack thereof that could be an issue for you at some point in the future. We'll get to that in just a few moments. First, I wanna hit some stats and I'm gonna be sharing my experience after using this camera over the last couple of months while leading photo workshops in Yellowstone National Park and the desert Southwest and even here in my backyard in Seattle. This video is brought to you by Squarespace, the fantastic all-in-one website platform. You can try Squarespace for free for 14 days, no credit card required. Start at squarespace.com slash TV to save 10% when you do go to buy. The Canon R10 has a 24.2 megapixel APS-C sensor, which is paired with Canon's latest Digic X processor. I found this combination delivering great image quality, excellent detail, acceptable noise levels. Above ISO 1600, you're gonna want to be a little more careful with your exposures, or you might wanna invest in a third-party program to reduce noise like Topaz Photo AI or DxO Pure Raw 3. Both of them work really well with these Canon files. I spent a lot of time using this kit lens, the 18 to 150, and the value packed RF 100 to 400. I've got a separate video covering this lens. It's actually a full frame lens. It's so small and lightweight that you wouldn't really know it. Now the 18 to 150 kit lens is very convenient and sharp enough for general family and travel photography. The sensor in this camera though is capable of producing sharper photos with a better lens. But we get to the rub. Canon doesn't offer any better native crop sensor mirrorless lenses at the moment. That's right. This 18 to 150 kit and the 18 to 45 kit are the only crop sensor RFS mirrorless lenses currently on the market, not including maybe some manual focus weirdness. Canon, 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 the company that for so long has had a huge pile of lenses available for all of their cameras currently has just two for RFS. Look, you don't need to stress about this too much. I imagine that Canon is very likely going to be releasing more lenses soon, and maybe, maybe even letting in some third-party options that actually autofocus. And in the meantime, you have incredibly good and affordable full-frame lenses like the 50mm f1.8 and this 100-400 that I already mentioned. And of course, you can adapt older lenses. But if one of your desires is to get good image quality and travel as light as possible, well, it's a little annoying to have to use full frame lenses on this camera. If that applies to you, I've got an alternative camera system that I'll recommend in a few minutes, but let's get back to what I love. And there's a lot here. It is fast. 23 frames per second when using the electronic shutter, 15 frames per second with the mechanical shutter, which is good because with the electronic shutter, Canon does caution you that you can get some distortion in faster moving subjects. I tested this at my kid's soccer game. Maybe they weren't fast enough. I didn't see any major distortion, but it is something that you need to be aware of. Not only do you run the risk of distortion though, you're not gonna get more than about a second of photos shooting raw at 23 frames per second, literally a second. Luckily, they give you a compromise. Under shutter mode, switch it to electronic first curtain, set the camera on high, not high plus. This is gonna give you almost eight frames per second. And in my testing, it ran continuously with no buffer slowdowns on a fast SD card. That's impressive. 
Switching to 15 frames per second gives you just about a second and a half of burst before you see slowdowns, but then it clears relatively quickly and continues to fire short bursts afterwards. The difference between 15 and 23 and how fast that buffer fills and how long it takes to clear is pretty amazing. Now, keep in mind, I've interviewed a pro photographer that's covered the Olympics and 10 frames per second is all she felt she needed to do her job. Just a fun fact, the slowest continuous shooting you can do with this camera is three frames per second, which was the fastest burst rate that the Rebel XT offered about 20 years ago. This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Many of you watching this are photographers. Squarespace understands photographers. The other day I was putting together a gallery of my favorite images from my Katmai workshop and I wanted this nice clean square grid. Squarespace made it so easy to display the portion of the image I wanted shown in that one by one aspect ratio. It's smart. You can try Squarespace out for free today. No credit card required for 14 days at squarespace.com slash TV. That'll also save you 10% when you do go to buy. Let's move on and talk about the autofocus system. It's very good. You've got subject selection here for people, animals, and vehicles, and I've tested it out over the last couple of months and found it to be reliable and capable. With people or animals selected, it often found the eye and was quite accurate. If no eye could be detected, it falls back to the head area. On vehicles, it locks onto the front or near the front, and overall, it's a very good system, and I really love having that face detection in here and clear feedback on what is in focus. That's very helpful. And that brings me to a larger point that I want to talk about with this camera that I think Canon has done a really nice job with. It doesn't feel like there's any arbitrary limitations in this affordable crop sensor mirrorless. It's a very nice thing to feel when you're buying a more budget friendly camera. It hasn't been cripple hammered. Hammer crippled? Not nah, cripple hammered. You've got a capable AF system. You've got a pile of useful features on top of that, like interval timer, bulb timer, multiple exposure, focus bracketing, and a decent amount of customizability, both in what you see on the screen and in the viewfinder and the buttons on the camera. I appreciate being able to turn off or on certain functions for certain buttons. For instance, the flash exposure compensation button over here while wearing gloves in the Yellowstone National Park, I frequently and accidentally activated this. You can turn it off, so that's not a problem. Now, one button that you can't customize that I feel a little it's odd, why not? is this lock button up top that is fairly prominently featured right next to the record button. It even feels similar in finger, in hand and finger. I don't know. You can't assign it anything else or even disable it. And I don't know why Canon loves locking controls. It's a feature that I find clients get tripped up on our workshops more than any other Canon feature, really. The button gets pushed or on other cameras, the lock switch gets switched and then people are confused why they can't change the settings on the camera. It's happened to me in the past as well. I'd love to know, leave a comment. Do you appreciate this feature? Is it something that you use often? Seems like a firmware update could allow us to customize this again in the future at some point. All right, let's talk a little bit more about ergonomics. This camera feels nice in the hand. It's a little bit on the small side. I can really only get two fingers comfortably around the grip with my pinky curled up underneath, but that grip is comfortable. I love this fully articulating screen with easy touch controls that Canon has always done really well. You've got dual dials for easy manual control and an AF joystick and a nicely featured AF button on the back for back button focus. I mean, this is an enjoyable camera to use. Now, along with those dual dials, you have an outer ring on the lens. Now on the smaller kit lens, you just have the zoom ring and one outer ring that can be either focus or act as a control ring. And that control ring is something that Canon has implemented on many of their mirrorless lenses. I have switched it to adjust exposure compensation. I typically shoot full manual with ISO on auto and find it to be very easy to do a quick turn of the ring to make my image a little darker, lowering the ISO, or a little brighter, raising the ISO. You could also assign a button to quickly switch back and forth between focus and control ring if you wanted. Let's move on and talk a little bit about video, something the Rebel XT could not do. This R10 can record 4K videos at up to 60 frames per second, though there is a crop there. And if you want real slow-mo action, you need to turn on high frame rate mode 
That gets you 120 frames per second, but only at 1080. And be careful, if you go into that mode, when you turn it back off, it does not jump back to whatever frame rate you were using. It defaults back to 1080 at 60 frames per second. That's annoying and something Canon should easily fix in a firmware update. But overall, video quality is good, focus is quite reliable, it works on face and eye again. And through the app, you have great wireless control if you want to do one of these talking head style videos. Like this. No, not those talking heads this talking head. And you're not arbitrarily limited to 30 minutes of recording. Last night I recorded a 4K 30 frames per second video for 47 minutes. It only stopped because the card filled up. And I didn't see any overheat warnings, although my living room was only about 65 degrees. So keep that in mind. It did warn me that it might overheat recording for a long period of time, but it didn't actually overheat. Now, the only thing you're really missing for serious video is a headphone jack, which if audio is important, that's a pretty big deal. The more expensive Canon R7, which is currently about $600 more, does offer an audio jack. Truthfully, that's not the only thing this little camera is missing. It doesn't have in-body image stabilization. That's right, the sensor is not stabilized, instead relying on the lenses. Both kit lenses are stabilized. Many other lenses you're gonna purchase are stabilized. But at some point in the future, if you wanna throw on a little prime lens and try to walk and talk, you might be disappointed without any stabilization. And although we're really kind of in the video section right now, I'm gonna mention that it's nice to have IBIS when shooting stills too. It lets you get away with lower shutter speeds, which allow you to lower that ISO when your subject allows it. And that can make for a more travel-friendly camera as well. I'm on a little bit of a roll with the R10 drawbacks. We're gonna move out of the video into just general other drawbacks. One is battery life. The battery life is just okay. It's separated between 240 shots if using the EVF and 340 shots if using the LCD. That is something that people often don't realize. This EVF is more power hungry than the LCD. It's a higher resolution. Those battery numbers are a little misleading. I certainly got more than that as I was out shooting in a variety of conditions, including 20 below zero. But if you do plan to photograph for a full day, you're definitely gonna want a second battery. Another thing that helps with battery life is the easy USB-C charging, which most of these cameras do offer now. That's really it, drawback-wise. I mean, there are some there to keep in mind, but at this price point, I think Canon has done a very nice job and I have overall positive opinions. But I do wanna chat briefly about other options within this price range. Sony a6400. I personally use Sony. And if you value a lightweight system with excellent autofocus, huge lens choice for crop sensors, Sony is a very good option. But the ergonomics of their crop sensor models like the a6400 are just okay. They don't provide that dedicated dual dial control. I'm emphasizing that. Yes, you have dual dials, but it's not dedicated in I just, I just don't love those crop sensors from Sony when you're trying to use them in full manual. Nikon has their Z50, which I might give a slight edge to in kind of use ergonomics, but overall usability and feature set, especially when you start to talk about video, I like the R10, especially because we've got this normal flip out screen, whereas the Nikon Z50 has gone for the flip down screen, which is just dumb. And then finally, you've got the Fuji XS10. I am a big fan of Fuji. And similar to the Sony system, you've got a fantastic collection of lenses designed specifically for crop sensors. So not only can you buy into a smaller, lighter camera, but then you're carrying around lenses designed specifically for that camera, giving you a lighter overall package. But let's talk for just a moment, just because I want to give you a bigger picture. When I purchased that Rebel XT way back in the early 2000s, I wasn't sure where photography was going to take me. I just knew that it was the best camera that I could afford at the time. However, it turned out that it was very nice that it was part of a full frame ecosystem that as I got more serious, allowed me to upgrade and move into full frame, carrying over some of those full frame compatible lenses that I had purchased. That's true of the Canon R10 and the Nikon Z50 and the Sony a6400. They all share mounts with full frame systems and you can buy full frame and use full frame lenses on those crop sensors and take them with you to full frame. With Fuji, you only have crop sensor and then a big jump to medium format and there's not gonna be any of your lenses that you can carry over. I mention this again because I want you to have the big picture and the most complete picture possible, but I 
being honest with you, these days, I don't think it matters nearly as much. The quality from these crop sensors is fantastic. And if you're looking for a good general photography, travel, kids sports, kids and sports, a lot of wildlife, crop sensor camera is going to give you everything you need and you should not feel pressure to upgrade to a larger sensor. Overall, I'm impressed with the Canon R10. I think it is a great camera, little camera, that is perfect for a variety of uses. If you're looking for a compact, lightweight camera that can deliver great image quality and performance, the R10 is definitely worth considering. Just be warned that for the time being, you have an extremely limited lens collection available to you without paying more for full frame lenses and carrying around a little bit more than you need. I'd love to know what manufacturer you think is currently offering the best crop sensor experience and ecosystem, and I bet others would who are watching this video. So please leave those comments right down below. And I hope you found this video helpful. If you could take a moment to hit that like button, I really appreciate that. And of course, if you're not already a subscriber, hit that subscribe button along with a little bell to be notified of future videos. I've got links to everything I've talked about in this video right down below, and I'm offering a pay what you want for my post-processing ebook. Information about that is right down below as well. Thanks so much for watching. Bye-bye.